Don't assume that even if it's a repeat client, it's a layup. I think you every single time you have to be prepared to sell yourself to, to, the, to the nil. Business of Architecture, episode 200. 200 episodes! Hello, I'm Enoch Sears, and this is the podcast for architects, where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for running a profitable and impactful architecture practice. I'd like to invite you to discover how to double your architecture firm income and create your dream practice of freedom and impact by downloading my free four-part architecture firm profit map. As a podcast listener, you can get instant access by going to freearchitectgift.com. Today's podcast is sponsored by AIA Advantage partner BQE Software, the makers of ArchiOffice. ArchiOffice is the only office and project management software designed specifically for architects. It helps you manage people and projects while you focus on designing great architecture. So whether you're working remotely or on-site, ArchiOffice allows you to monitor the status of your projects and tasks and send out invoices in an accurate and timely manner. Get your fully functional 15-day trial of ArchiOffice by going to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash demo. Today we speak with Lance Psycho and Alex Gore, partners at the architecture and design firm F9 Production based out of Longmont, Colorado. These guys are great examples of the entrepreneurial spirit. Since starting their firm in 2009, they've grown both the size and scale of the projects they work on, including a current project where they are actually developing themselves. So today we talk about selling architecture. Yep, that's right. Without further ado, here's today's show. Alex and Lance, welcome to Business of Architecture. Yeah, thanks. Hey, we're glad to be here. Yeah, thanks for having us, Enoch. Yeah, absolutely. So you guys just got finished recording an episode of your podcast, Inside the Firm. Tell our listeners about that podcast and that show. What's it all about? Yeah, so uh, Lance and I, we're, we're business partners, and our firm is about eight, eight people. Um, and we also we teach at CU. And honestly, we're running back and forth all the time that the only time that we kind of get to talk is either going to CU or, you know, or, or coming back from it. That's the University of Colorado Boulder. Um, and a lot of times we might meet there or else we're talking about other stuff. <clears throat> and a lot of the things that we were discussing had to do with, you know, our design build project, um, what we want to do or, or lessons learned. And we just thought we felt like this was interesting and that people might want to hear it. So instead of just doing it privately be- between us, we're basically just having that conversation um, and then putting it out there in the podcast. And that's why it's simply titled Inside the Firm. So it's an inside look of uh, the entrepreneurial stuff that we're doing, um, regular business stuff. Um, there's a little ARE talk too, just because it, it, it's relevant. Um, and then the major thing is this design build, because I think that's always interesting to a lot of people. They'd love to be like Jonathan Segal or, or even going back to that kind of master builder uh, concept back in the middle ages. Um, and we are, we are stepping into that now. We've done a whole bunch of architecture. We've built some small things um, privately between us. Lance uh, was basically a contractor up in North Dakota in the army. I built stuff. Um, we built tiny houses. We built three tiny houses now, but now we're going to do a, a development. Um, so it's basically eight units, and then our new offices will be there. So we're kind of chrono, you know, going through that as, as the weeks on goes by. And we've always found, you know, the more we give, the more we get. So we kind of just tell everything as it is um who knows how that will go apparently i was making fun of the city the other last week but (laughs) you know sometimes that happens lance what's your take on it what's your motivated motivation for being part of the podcast well i just like to talk and make jokes (laughs) are you the no uh so um we like to put ourselves out there as alex mentioned um and so you know podcasting podcasting is uh, for us at least you know the startup cost to do one you know it can only be a couple hundred dollars i think we that's all we've sunk into this so far including microphones recording equipment getting the soundcloud app up and everything like that and the rss feeds um so there was just there were just so many conversations that alex and i would have uh driving to a meeting or driving to 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 go teach like he mentioned where i thought man it feels Feels like this should be recorded because I think there's some valuable there's some valuable insight here that other people could use, uh, and 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 we shouldn't be bashful about sharing it. I think it took us at least literally seven years of being in business, of uh, me also getting licensed, Alex on his way to his licensure, and for us and getting enough projects under our belt 
including design build stuff to where we were confident about what we were saying too. Yeah. So I think it was about the, about the right time um, for us to do this. We also have always tried to do one fun project per year. Uh, so we, you know, Alex mentioned we, we built a tiny house. We built two more last year. Uh, we were on HGTV for the first one and we've done a couple other websites and stuff like that. So for us, this is, this is one of our fun projects um, that we'd like to continue. And the feedback has been great. Uh, we, like, like you mentioned, we just recorded episode 10 um, we're gonna put that up later today but we actually got an email from a from a, a, an architect out out east in North Carolina and he said I just love how raw it actually is he's like there's no intro music there's no outro music you guys just turn the microphone on, you, microphone on you talk about what's on your minds in regards to your firm and he said uh, there's nothing like that out there so I, I think um, we just kind of stumbled upon you know uh, doing something that we love to do and then people are actually starting to respond to it in, in positive ways yeah and the other thing that we do is we have a, a segment too when we aren't just you know talking off the cuff is that we go back through all of our old projects and old projects that have an interesting story and we'll we'll say okay this is what happened and what we did and what was either right or wrong about that um, and then the lessons learned from that um, so so I think I, I, I hopefully think there's a lot of value in it and we're trying to include other members of so you know that other architect that i mentioned he wrote us this awesome email just saying hey thanks for thanks for doing this i really enjoyed listening to you guys you guys are also entertaining um so we also started another segment and it's called worst our uh, worst advice best advice so we have listeners or other other people that we're interested in, in hearing from just record and tell us what the worst professional advice you've gotten is and what the best professional advice you've gotten. Um, and, and so we do a three minute segment about that. And then we just talk about what we think about their advice, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> whether we kind of agree with it or not, but it's kind of a good way to get other people, you know, interested in the podcast. And then also, um, people who are already interested in it, just, just hearing more than our voices too. It's kind of like a, a sort of a way I think we'll get more guests on. Yeah. And, uh, we just got yours. <laughs> So you will be on there <laughs> next week, um, give, given your your advice, which which, which was great. Um, so I don't know. There's there's really some interesting things. I, I kind of really want to say what yours is, <laughs> but that would kind of kind of spoil it. Um, well, go ahead because mine. Uh, yeah, this your our our interview right now isn't going to go live for maybe a month or two. So yours will go oh, live okay. before. So, so could you expand on it? You, you say what was your best advice? My my best advice that I got was learn how to sell. Yeah, and and I, I don't I don't think um, we, we think sometimes architects think it's it, it it's dirty or that they're trying to be sleazy. But when you sell something that you're passionate in, I think it comes across as natural. And I think that's just the the vein that you have to find in whatever you're doing to be authentic because people can tell if you're being authentic or not. Mark LePage said his worst advice was that architects don't have to sell themselves. And so yeah, I think, someone told him. So that. I think that's he actually I think he was on episode seven or something of, of our podcast. But um, because I think a lot of them have this idea that their art, you know, because it's this, it's this balance between art and science, right? That's architecture is that it's just it's going to sell itself and we don't have to be business people. Like somehow we just get money magically. But at the end of the day, I don't know. I've never got money magically. I haven't got any magic money. <laughs> Still waiting. <laughs> <laughs> Still waiting for that magic check in the mail, you know. Yeah. And and I don't know if anyone ever taught me that explicitly, but it's definitely something that I I, I guess maybe I invented it myself. I mean, back in architecture school, you know, I kind of had this idea, like you guys said, that hey, you just do good work and and projects will just come in the door. I mean, architects are in yeah. demand. Yeah, and I always thought about this in the beginning, probably third year. I think I caught on this idea because third year in school. Yeah. Yep, you always have crits. You always have you know, and and th I think what's uh, conveyed to you as a student is, oh, do good work, right? But you actually have to market yourself in the crit, or you have to market that idea. And you have to say maybe how that idea relates to the program or the concept or a lot of times something larger than yourself, how it's relating to society. And th there should almost be an architecture marketing or, or, or business class. There's professional practice, but there's not a there's not a 
business or or a marketing class and i think crits are you marketing yourself exactly i oh i that's what i thought of them as too 100 percent. is yeah. i thought oh i am selling i am selling the project during the critique but like you said i don't think a lot of students i don't think a lot of other students come to that conclusion and it, i bet you there are a bunch of students listening to your podcast um and as you know a lot of them you know you might have a crit at eight in the morning and they stayed up till two three o'clock and they just come in looking disheveled or, or all that that um, please because everyone learns better through iteration so start doing that now and start thinking of yourself as marketing your your product now and we had a great guy in school and I think why we learned this in third year is um, he was his senior 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 thesis um, was it was a beautiful church and then he had this this great logo that looked very professional and everything he had the, the whole package you know he dressed up which you're supposed to do and we were just blown away we were just blown away by that's him. from from the littlest part of his marketing he, like he, he developed kind of his own personal logo yep and then it just infused all the way through and so even when we teach at CU we try to instill that yep. <laughs> in students is that now is when you start brown branding yourselves you should even be like after this class go out and buy your domain name you know actually buy your name domain name and alex i think alex did a, we did that first yeah year i bought yours too but you haven't set it up um oh you're paying for that i owe your i own your name <laughs> <laughs> um and i remember going up and asking him just just because i want to know the concept i actually asked how did you come up with this logo and he goes, oh, I started it my first year and I've been refining it ever since then. So it wasn't the answer I was thinking. I was thinking, you know, what was your part to you? What was your inspiration? And he went back to process and said, since first year, I have been iterating. So it's, it's never too early. Um, and then you can keep refining that because, you know, a lot of times your first idea isn't, isn't your best idea. And like Lance said, we teach at CU and we tell some of the, I think we, we forgot to tell them for midterms, but we'll tell them for finals to come up with a name and a logo. And I still remember one guy called his his little firm like Red Dog Design yeah. and he had this outline of this dog and it was a very you know more of country aesthetic and I was like it fit in perfectly I still I still remember him yeah don't yeah. remember his name but if his website was that I'd, I'd go Google you know the the back to the selling yourself the last firm that I worked for before starting F9 I distinctly remember um I landed. I landed us a meeting with uh, a company that would go after government contracts, and then, but then they would they would they would need architects to do that portion of it. So they were just kind of like big enough. I don't know. I don't know what exactly they did, but somehow they got these big government contracts for development, and then they hired everybody else out. And we were in a meeting because because we wanted to start getting into that work. And one of the guys who was my who's my cousin who was my age has nothing to do with architecture. And he goes, he just simply asked them. He goes. He asked the principals of that firm. He goes, "How are you guys marketing yourselves?" And they said, "Or how do you how do you guys get work? What do you, how do you guys advertise?" And I, I the look on their face was like they were they were asked, I don't know, uh, they were asked, uh, you know, just some crazy question that they would never thought they would be asked. I mean, it was just like a blank fight face. And they said, "We've never had to advertise." So I, I don't know if also some maybe that's also government work, right? Well, yeah. not government work though. So oh. they, they, we were going after government work. They'd been in the private sector their whole their whole professional careers with this other firm. So you know you have to advertise. I think. I mean, we do, but they they had never had to. So what I'm getting at is there might be some truth. You know, if I play devil's advocate here, I think there might be some truth in some firms. Maybe don't have to do it at all. Maybe they're never forced. To have to advertise whereas we just come at it from the complete opposite spectrum and we always we always have and we always will is we started this we started our firm from nothing we just use renderings to start it and we we've always had to advertise and put ourselves out there in any kind of way possible we've never we've we've just now this last year after seven years started to get residual work you know ref, referral work from other people and i know that we're rambling but i want to continue on this vein <laughs> Because we kind of complain that uh, schools don't don't teach this, um, but complaining only goes so far. And I have an idea for you, Enoch. You obviously know technology. You have these Skype meetings all the time. I'm sure you have. I think you have a business mastermind group or, or something like that where you communicate with, with multiple people. Have you ever thought about going to the universities and doing an online elective where you actually meet with them and you teach them business of architecture? They'll pay you. <laughs> Never, never considered it, man. You know, and I, I think that, you know, that's that's a great idea. But I, I wonder, I wonder if students really care about it. I mean, perhaps there's a reason mm -hmm. why they don't teach business in, in architecture school. 
Yeah, you're right. You're right. I, I've wondered the same thing. If, how many people actually actually really care about it We're versus, you know, people that want to go out there and start their own firm or just be a sole proprietor versus I, I, you're probably, I think it's probably a minority compared to the most people that just want to get a job. What might be the, the, the way to test it is, you know, email call, whatever Dean at whatever university, you know, you're out in California and, um, just put a threshold on the elective and say, if 12 people don't sign up, 15 people don't sign up, we just won't do it, you know? Um, but man, I feel like you're the guy to do that. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's a great it's idea. It's all in the name, right? So <laughs> let, let's go back. So talking about school, what do you guys think is, what's different? Would you both say, and we'll go one each to get your answer on this. What's different between the kind of persuasion that you do in a crit where you're persuading your peers, your professors versus the kind of persuading, the way you might give a presentation to persuade clients? That's in, I think for me, it depends on what stage you're going at. If it's to get the client, I think you're more talking about the fundamental structure of your firm and the knowledge that you can provide. And not only, you know, you can hit them with the images um, and if they see and like your aesthetic, that's probably a huge part, right? And that's what they think of. But I think you need to set yourself apart by saying um, either, hey, we've done this and we're taking the lessons that we learned and applying it um, to either save you money, make a better product, get through the city faster. Um, you know, site plan review has become huge. I'm sure it's huge in, in, in every state almost. And it's basically bigger than getting your construction documents permits um, because the difference is there's five or six people from all different, you know, backgrounds from engineers to civils to looking at it first. When you're getting your construction set, it's the one building guy and you can just point to that code and he can either argue or you don't argue and then, you know, you're done. Um, so you could take, you know, hey, we've been through this five, six times for this specific project. We have a whole checklist. You know, we're ready to go um, so that they see like, OK, time is money. They're just going to hit the ground running. Um, and the other thing is that I think you have to bring enthusiasm and, and uh, uh, that enthusiasm come through passion. Sometimes you see that in school. But um, I think I think you can't be low energy in, in those initial things. Um when you're selling your design to them, that first iteration, I think maybe it does more mimic school a mm -hmm. little bit because you can you can have like a sketch or an inspiration and, and kind of speak to the heart and soul of what they're doing, um, which, which is more of what school does. It's more about that, you know, that design. And they just assume that you've already implemented those principles of sustainability or, you know, efficiency in that heart and soul you know, presentation where in school, I don't even know if you have the vocabulary to talk about UL listing numbers and, you know, <laughs> all that other stuff that goes into it. Yeah. I think uh, <laughs> uh, it's it's more it has to be more like school. I don't know. I think both both are both at the beginning are just like school for me. When I'm selling a client, I'm talking about I'm showing them pieces of, of our portfolio and why they should hire us. But there's no critique in the back end. It's as simple as that. If I, then if I'm selling a floor plan to a client um, after you know the schematic in, right when we're in schematic design after we sign the contract, then then I get then I get the critique comments um, and we go from there. So it, it's one and the same though, and that's why I think that's I really believe that. That's when I realized it was the same as you Yeah, in, in college. And speaking about school, it'd be interesting if, if they went through that exercise of putting together, you know, pretending they were a firm, putting together a proposal, maybe listing some backstories. I don't know that, that they, I don't know how they would mimic that, but we know for a fact that it's not always the low bid that gets it. So I think we are only in a running between two firms and uh, we, we are lower than the other firm, but the other firm got it because they had more experience in that in that specific project that they had um so it, it's just it, it's interesting um and and i i don't think people think that they always need to be the low bid but it would be interesting if if you know students did that and they're like well i was a low bid and they're like well it didn't matter because i like this guy better you know yeah what have you guys learned about selling uh from the time that you started your firm up until now what are some of the key lessons Never forget the fundamental. Uh, per, yeah, uh, never, never forget um, your fundamental sales pitch, and that includes bringing all 
all guns loaded, so to speak, as far as like um, everything in your portfolio that is pertinent to the meeting. We've let we've dropped the ball recently a couple times in the past year or two. When we first when we first started the firm, I'd say within the for the first four or five years, Alex and I would double up on the meetings, and, other, and you know he and I would both go to the meetings, especially if it was a, you know maybe a, for us a big project back in the day would be maybe a duplex, and now now it's townhomes, right? Yeah. Um, well, I just sent out a bid for forty five of them. Yeah. yeah. So uh, we have admittedly dropped the ball uh, in the past year or two, and and we've noticed that. And well, we've me, talked about me, what this. does that mean? Drop the ball to explain that to uh, me. Yeah. So we were going after some assisted living facilities down in down in Denver Lakewood, and Lance and I showed up and we gave our little pitch. Um, and we did actually the both of us were there, but I think that's only because we were both down in Denver, and. I think our price was probably in line and we we didn't get in we asked hey why didn't mm. we get it and he said well these other people uh, I think they have a little bit more experience and they're a bigger firm than 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 you guys and it's just and, and then he said and it, and and it's just you and Alex and we don't think if it's just you two you guys can handle it and, and I and we go oh we got eight guys yeah, we've eight done people. you know <laughs> eight of these projects why didn't we bring all of our so, portfolio so we, we dropped the ball by not bringing uh, a our for, uh, a our portfolio, and then B. Here's a list of our personnel. Here's how big we are. We can absolutely handle it. Just bringing all the confidence to the meeting, and and not uh, not missing a beat when we should we should be talking every single point that we could about our about ourselves and our firms and our capabilities up. Um, so that's I guess that's a pretty good example. And we uh, didn't we work with these guys in the past? We actually yeah. did these this would have been a re- repeat client. Yeah. Uh, we did a remodel to an existing house. We turned it into an assist a group assisted facility and then and then they said that one was successful. We helped them be successful through design and then we just thought it was a layup. Yeah. Of oh, they're going to be a repeat client. So I guess there you go. That'd be the second thing is don't assume don't assume that even if it's a repeat client, it's a layup. I think you every single time you have to be prepared to sell yourself to, to the to the nil. Yep, and I think we hilt. we assume that they knew where we were and that we were growing, but we we never told them. And I've heard advice many times. And my dad worked at IBM, and and he was up in a leadership position. And basically, they'd say, "You repeat yourself," you know. And and uh, uh, I've heard I don't know where I heard this, but repeating yourself, like you do need to repeat yourself. I think it becomes um. Who who's the money guy who has like the baby steps? I don't know. Uh, baby you know, steps. Do you know Dave Ramsey. Dave Ramsey. Dave yes. Ramsey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So he says, repeat. Your, leaders need to repeat yourself because you're instilling a, a culture. The other reason to repeat yourself uh, in marketing or as a business leader is that we're out getting jobs all the time. Everyone's getting out jobs. You probably haven't said that to that client. You know, like that's a yeah. new client. You met 10 people this week. You said that nine times, but you do have to say it the 10th time because they don't, they don't know. So, and every time, even if it is a repeat client, when you're going after that bid, what I would just say, even if it's the third or fourth, update your proposal. So, you know, you have your proposal with, you know, your terms and conditions and contracts and boiler plates. We now have, you know, a header that has our images and, you know, it says that we've been on HGTV, sell, you know, sell that stuff too. But I would almost update like, hey, we're now this big. We've done more of these projects, yeah. you know, just that could be your reminder point. So they're like, oh, yeah. I, and then they, oh, yeah, of course they've grown, you know, we like them. So I'm sure other people like them too. Um, and that could be the way that you keep letting them know. My most recent lesson about sales is sales never stop. And that means, so we do a, we do a lot of online marketing. Um, we use two different websites and with those websites, there's an app that's on my phone that I can respond to requests for service. Um, so sales never stop. And that means it doesn't stop on, on the weekends and it doesn't stop on the night at night either. And I used to, I, we, we, we have a, generally we have a pretty hard and fast rule at our firm that we're not going to take meetings, um, if it eats into family time, but I can, I can at least respond to that person who has a request for a proposal from me or something on a weekend or something. If it's, you know, what does it take me? Five minutes to respond back to them in an email and stuff like that. So for me, sales never stop, and it and it's helped 
we land extra clients most recently. Yep. Um, but I would say as a caveat, not to run yourself into the ground um, because as you get older, we're not too old, but we're feeling the effects that you need that break. So we do, when they say, hey, can you come on the weekend? You know, for, no, we cannot. Yeah, you know? I, I'm still hard and fast about that, but I will digitally communicate with them and sometimes do a phone call too after hours. But the in-person stuff is still pretty hard and fast. Yeah. Awesome. So is there anything in addition to what you already said that you felt kind of made you drop the ball in, in that one instance, that one example you gave? I, I would just go over, you know, just say complacency and what getting, was getting comfortable. Yeah. Gosh, just getting comfortable for like the last two years, we finally got to a comfortable level of work to where we're not panicking. Um, and that's why we've, we've expanded like we have. So I think uh, you did. This this applies for almost everything. I would think that you just you just get to a comfortable level at whatever you're doing, and how do you remind yourself that um, it's not okay to be comfortable? Someone <laughs> else wants to eat your lunch. Exactly every time, you know? mm -hmm. and that actually goes. Somebody's back. always hungrier and younger too. One hundred percent. When the first project I got was for a commercial project, and, and it was what seven eight years ago, um, and I asked them why they why I got it, and it was during the recession. They said uh, you respond to the quickest. You're prefer professional and then you over delivered well guess what there's someone eight years younger than me there's someone or or or, or someone who's just remembering this who's a, it doesn't even matter the age that are trying to do those fundamental things too and if you drop drop the ball on on any of them why would they not why would they not go with someone else you know they're looking to get the best value they're looking to make sure that you're on task and and, and all that stuff so just just keep up with that that that's what i'd say yeah you know, I really like that word hunger. I think it really describes it describes a desire. Uh, how would you guys say that you cultivate that hunger in you know to keep that edge? Uh, <clears throat> one the the fundamental one that always boils down to, and I don't know if this is a good thing, is that uh, I always remember the recession. I always remember uh, literally working from school. I know everyone works hard at, at school, but nights, weekends, you know, even drinking on Friday night, being at studio at eight o'clock in the morning, uh, being in, in, in the army, working at, at Leapskin, working till midnight all the time, one, two in the morning. Um, and guess what? Nope, the recession happened, legs are cut out. You're literally back at mom and dad's that I could only take for a very short period. And, it, and, it, and it's, you know, you, you win awards, you, you do the right thing, quote unquote, you know, from your own perspective and, and you go, I am poor and have nothing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and I try to spin that into something, something good. You know, I try to sp now spin that in, you know, now we're, you know, we're doing fine. We're doing stuff that is really fun, but there's other guys that count on us. Uh, my wife counts on us. Lance has a family. I have a newborn baby, um, all that. And I, and I want to go, we, we can't go back there. Like it's not an option to go back to, to, to that low place. And there are circumstances that you cannot control, but we, we even found, we started in the recession. It was still the re recession and it was a, it was a hard ax to grind. Um, but now, hopefully, even during these these times when we're we're more comfortable, we actually want to build up that base, and then so that when that hard axe comes, we don't want to be complacent and say, "Oh, we have a we have a slush fund," you know, that we can just kind of chill at. We want to keep hitting that and keep bringing that enthusiasm, so that maybe when if we're still grinding and if the recession lasts for a year and a half or two years and things almost come to a halt then that's when you use that fund to maybe gap that six months or you know not where nothing's coming in but where it's very dry so uh that's where i try to get my passion from or where it comes from naturally yeah my most recent uh passion refuel i'll call it is bills never stop so the, the, the more money you make, the more bills you have. Um, so we had our most profitable year to date so far last year, and we got the tax bill, uh, and it was huge. <laughs> <laughs> and then at the same time that we got the tax bill, we purchased we – we took a significant amount of our own personal money and a significant amount of the firm's money to purchase this piece of land for which we're going to do, do the development on. And so you know those – 
that two headed snake is now driving Alex and I up, you know, to just sales as much as possible, be as profitable as possible, still do absolute, you know, quality work and all that. But the bills never stop. It's, you know, I mean, Biggie Small said it right you know, from the beginning, as he said, you know, more money, more problems, yes. um, but for better or for worse. But that's recently the most um, the most relevant uh, or the most recent uh, reason to keep stay hungry is that the plate got bigger and there's just more. You got to get more food to fill it. And that is a wrap. Thank you for listening today. If you're looking for more time, freedom, impact, and income as an architect, get instant access to my free four-part architect profit map by visiting freearchitectgift.com. Today's podcast is sponsored by AIA Advantage partner BQE Software, the makers of ArchiOffice. ArchiOffice is the only office and project management software designed specifically for architects. It helps you manage people and projects while you focus on designing great architecture. So whether you're working remotely or on-site, ArchiOffice allows you to monitor the status of your projects and tasks and send out invoices in an accurate and timely manner. Get your fully functional 15-day trial of ArchiOffice by going to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash demo. The views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment except to help you conquer the world.